see you here in worship. It's good to have all those people uh, on Facebook with, uh, with us as we stream live and uh, even on YouTube as they watch later uh, on this. Uh, I was telling the deacons that uh, usually, um, you know, if we have 30 or 40 people here on Sunday mornings, uh, then we'll end up with 50, 60 people that'll or watch some of the, at least some of the worship with us on Sunday from streaming. But then later on through the week, sometimes there's much as 100 people uh, after that that watch. And so very often uh, uh, our ministry goes on through the week as, as people watch our worship. And, and uh, I know folks that, <laughs> that uh, go to two or three church services a week now. Uh, and uh, that's kind of fun. I hope my mama's on here. Uh, she's been watching every week, and somebody was helping her figure it out, and I think she's got the hang of, the, of it. I bought her a new iPad, and she's got it, got it down pat. So, uh, so it's good to have, uh, it's good to have my cousin from uh, two of my cousins from California are watching every week with us now. Isn't that fun? Uh, they've never been able to see me uh, in worship. Uh, to preach or even before all those 30 something years of doing music but now they're able to participate in worship so that's kind of a fun thing uh, last week I also noticed a young gentleman that had watched later in the week uh, I know he, him uh, that he's stationed somewhere in what I would presume would be Afghanistan or a forward base you know for our military and at some point, whenever it works out good for him, he goes and watches our, our worship, and he's responded at times to things we've said and done and, and talked about, so it's fun. You know, uh, uh, this world gets just a little bit smaller every day, doesn't it? <laughs> so why don't we worship together, singing uh, uh, an old hymn together. If you'd stand with me, we're going to sing... Uh, that's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Amen.
wonderful God. It is to you that we lift our praises. It is you that we sing glory to. And we love you, God. And we thank you for your good and kind and graciousness to our lives. We consider the, the mercy that you pour out on us daily as to be a blessing from above, Lord. Something that we don't deserve. It's grace in our life, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ultimately thank you for your sacrifice that bought, paid, purchased for us eternal life. And we look forward to that day when we spend that with you. But Lord, between then and now, we ask that you will guide us and teach us, that you'll forgive us when we fall away. Lord, we ask that you will help us us keep our eyes on the prize of, of glory for that day coming and in this life Lord may we be witnesses for your glory God I pray for those that uh, specific prayers that are that are needed and, and relevant today we think of Miss Carolyn Sims and I see you we think of my mama uh, who is very ill right now possibly pneumonia we think of Larry Parks and we give praise for what you've been doing in his life. God, we pray for those people who have lost loved ones, for the family of Bertie Brewer and for J.C. Lloyd's family. Lord, encourage them, bless them. We, it, uh, it breaks our heart, Lord, to see what's going on. Lord, we pray for Haskin and Annabelle Mitchell, um, hospitalized with pneumonia. Uh, we pray for all those others that are ill, and we ask that you would work in their lives and encourage them. This is our prayers, Lord, and here as we praise your name, will you hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing again another hymn. chilling when you came in I didn't know now we're ch we're childless this is the first day in a long time that we don't have the kids I know some are out of town this week and kind of miss little ones you know <laughs> we love those little ones but we could talk about specific little ones if you want <laughs> grandchildren you know our deacons meeting uh, turned into just a comparison of grandchildren today <laughs> that's basically what we talked about in deacons meeting uh, <clears throat> just a few uh, uh, announcements uh, of course our boxes have not been deli delivered yet that we have a specific date I think it's still a week away um, but these are the boxes that we've collected 51 boxes and we prayed over those last week praying that God's uh, blessing of the good news of the gospel will go out with these boxes as those kids uh, get a all these Christmas gifts um, Sunday school we had our second Sunday school this morning be sure and come at 10 o'clock we usually have donuts and something to drink and and uh, um, everyone is invited to that Chil we have a children's portion of that that's it, but we're all in together 
And so I'm kind of enjoying that. That's been neat. And uh, uh, youth will meet tonight again. They're meeting on Sunday nights now instead of Wednesday nights. And it's at 5. And are we going to be at our church tonight? Is that right? So, so my, we're watching a movie. Awesome. So uh, let me know if you, I need to hook up anything, okay? <laughs> okay, because uh, I stole the DVD back there. <laughs> so I need to get that back. Uh, I say I stole it. That, yeah, I shouldn't say that streaming all over the world. The pastor didn't steal a DVD player. He took it to another classroom. <laughs> um, you'll see reports uh, for our finances. Uh, and uh, we, uh, deacons, went over our finances uh, for the last month again this morning, and uh, we actually took in more than we spent, and that's always a good thing. So our finances are really doing well. Uh, so praise God for that. Um, well, how about we continue with our worship and singing another song? This is one of our new songs that we have been learning. We uh, sang it for the first time last week and we're gonna sing it this week. You wanna stand with me? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed?
can be seated. We'll sing that again in a moment. We are on a sermon series, an authentic encounter with Christ. And our desire is that we might all find opportunities to encounter Christ in our time where we worship God privately or corporately together, times that we are praying, uh, that our prayer and our fasting would so bring us that close to God that we have that encounter with Him. Encounters that are life-changing, encounters that, that move us closer to Him, encounters that are not just emotional. There are times in where we truly grow in our relationship with him. That's what we want. Well, today our scripture is very well known to most of you. Second Chronicles 7, 14. You might be able to say it out loud with me. I, I don't think I heard this scripture often until the last 20 or 30 years, but now we seem to speak it often. Second Chronicles 7, 14. It says that, if my people, and this is God speaking, uh, by the way, the, 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 the idea here is that King Solomon has just become king and has just built the temple. And uh, right after his father David dies, then he begins the temple. And uh, it's a glorious thing. And so they worship God and they give God all the glory for the temple. And God has already acknowledged in Solomon's life that he's going to be a wise and a wonderful king. And then he comes and he visits Solomon in that evening after all their praises and their, to him and their acknowledgement of who God is in the life of his people. And he says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. And you know, there's many people in America today that want that for us. They say, oh Lord, <laughs> heal our land. Lord, we need your profound presence in the life of our country there was a time in where we had this sense that we were a christian nation but uh, for forgive me this is just a one person's opinion but but we're, if we have not walked away from that if we were ever there truly there we are no longer there it's a sad time for the morality and the justice and Christianity in our land. And it's not just about politics. I think politics are just following the move, the slippery slope of general morality, of moving away from God. It's not vice versa. They're not pushing us away from God, whoever they are. <laughs> it's... It's them filling in the void. So regarding the election situation, I, I think that, I, do, don't you ever think years from now what things are going to look like to people in the future? You know, they're going to dig up our bones. They're going to say, man, that dude was fat. <laughs> man, that dude should have had more whatever calcium in his diet or whatever. They're going to look at us prehistoric people all those years from now. They're going to study in the books, you know, what they were like, you know, and, 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 and what we were like at this time. And I, I think now that, that, that someday kids are going to be taught what it was like. And, and, and 
then the teacher's going to say, and that was 2020, and they'll go, oh, we've heard about 2020. That makes sense. It's a crazy time. And then we throw COVID in. You know, we've spoken about COVID before in, in relation to this uh, aspect. It, if, if it doesn't cause this, the pandemic and, and, and everybody's reaction to it, not, I mean, it may be all just, but, but if we just look at what's actually happened, it doesn't, want, does it, doesn't not want, make you, as God's people, want to cry out to him? To call out to God and say, God, what, what is your will in all this? What, what are you trying to say to us? What's next? Well, I've alluded to this before, about five or six, five weeks ago, I believe. I believe revival is one of the things that is coming. I believe that it's possible. I, I, I'm not a prophet. Unfortunately, you can't uh, go out today and just plan your financial situation based on what Brother Paul is saying. But you can get a sense of your spiritual situation that God is working. God didn't create necessarily the pandemic or the COVID or anything that for, for, for his design or purposes, but he's going to use it for his design and purposes, I guarantee. And my hope and my plan in his foreknowledge of what was going to happen is that it would bring about revival. I heard a man speaking about revival a few months ago, and he said there's one two-letter word that defines revival. Well, I, man, I was trying to figure out what he was going to say. Do you know what it is? <laughs> that was a good one. I should have thought. Actually, I got another one. Go. He says, revival means go. Think about that. Revival is the beginning place in where we go. We move out. In every revival, and of course a revival does take a me, doesn't it? I like that. That may preach better than what this guy's idea was. That his idea was that we go. We, we are changed into God's likeness. God's people is who the revival's for. It's not for the people outside of here. It's for us. And then we spill out. We're like cups that overflow. We spill out into the, our neighborhood. We spill out into the street. We spill out into the people that we're working for. And, and our revival is within us. And it awakens people spiritually. So that's the term you always hear, revival and spiritual awakening. Revival's for the church. Spiritual awakenings for the responses that people have as a result of when the church gets right. Because the church ain't right. I, I'm, I'm not picking on us here either. I'm talking about the, the church, the big church, all. These are unprecedented, extraordinary times. And I know they have been devastating to so many. You know, this past week, my mom got a, a respiratory infection and she is really sick. And I mean, those things just kick her down when she gets those. And the doctor was sure it was COVID, y'all. Wow, my mom's 80, almost 88 years old. What would that do to her? I, I had a few days of concern. I had to ask y'all to help me pray for her. And fortunately, yesterday we found out that she was negative. That's great. That's a grand thing. Uh, she was in quarantine already, just in case. But, but folks, it's a scary thing. I don't know what it feels like for, for families. You know, the brewer lost Angela. There's other people that have passed away in our city even from this thing and that is scary it's 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 it just takes things away but even in that loss god has something good in store is it revival it's an extraordinary time is this a time of revival rioting looting <laughs> you know you can go back into the old testament 
and you can find all these things happen. And, you know, there are people on TV right now that are preaching, oh, this is the times that they were talking about, you know? This is what's really happening. Uh, who am I to say it's not? But I will say this. This is the perfect time for God to act in our lives in a fresh way. So are, let me ask you, are the alarms going off in your spirit like they are in mine? Is there a, a, something deep down in your gut that you sense in your spirit that perhaps God is moving a new and fresh way? I mean, God's, God's way doesn't change, but, but how, he, how he deals with us, fortunately, is new and fresh every morning. Does it not seem as though God is preparing for something or preparing us for something, good or bad? I, I don't know. Easy or tough? I have no idea. You know, there are many believers that believe that if this so-called social movement, we used to call communism, it's called something else now, if that persists through politics, then we're headed towards a, a horrible, devastating time for the church. But then there are other believers who believe that that is exactly what happened to the original church. Remember when we, we, were, we were studying Asia Minor churches all summer? Uh, that's what made them explode. Because they were under the pressures of government. They were under the pressure of people not loving God. Is, is that what it's coming to? Perhaps, then, it's a time to wake up. We've said that before. I've, I've used the term wake up almost every week in this sermon series. We, we've been hitting the snooze button since at least 1950 in the church. If you look at statistics, they would, well, number one, they'd bore you to death, so we're not going to look at statistics, but they would shock you to know how the church falls, falls, falls for 70 years. That's most, that's the majority of all of our lives. Have we become irrelevant in society? Is that why we're getting run over? Here's a term that I named my sermon, Acadia, A-C-E-D-I-A. -E Have you ever heard that word? Baylor University has a, a, a study in their Christian studies called Acadia. <laughs> they have professors that teach this idea. It's an important thing in their mission statement. Acadia is defined as a state of listlessness, laziness, not caring, not being concerned with one's position <laughs> or the concern of the world. Can you see a person in Acadia what they might wear? Not much, right? Nothing nice, extremely loose, rarely washed. <laughs> Can you imagine that? What, what would they do for a living? Not much, right? <laughs> they would get by with the very least that they could. What would they be concerned about? What would be their daily routine? Not much. <laughs> Acadia, the type of people who, uh, in Greek times, uh, it literally meant in uh, original uh, ancient Greek, uh, Acadia, spelled with a K back then, uh, was actually meant an inert state. It's like a chemical compound that never happens. It just kind of lays there. It also means without pain or without care. My friends, I believe it's talking about America. I believe we are asleep at the wheel. 
I believe we are missing out. We're just kind of cruising through. And it doesn't mean that we voted in or didn't vote in the right person. That, it's so far above that. It has so much more to do with where we each are spiritually. You, you, I, I, I've spoken to you some about the church I was at before. We were trying to make a church in Pine Bluff relevant to the area where it was. And uh, I so remember when I went there and I spoke to those people about the prospect of ministering with them there, and they would tell me these stories. And it was a, it's a big, beautiful building. I mean, it's, it's huge. And, and they would tell about the stories that I remember so clearly. They said you'd go out to the front steps, you know, and it'd be about 15 till 11, and people would be, would be coming out of their houses and people would be out on the sidewalks and they families and they could see them coming and there'd be just rows of people walking through the 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 sidewalks coming up to church not just the people driving not just the people being picked up by the bus ministry it'd be people coming to walking into church you could see it happening at a certain time every sunday nobody walks to that church anymore Nobody. It's such a different atmosphere. Now, they're still doing ministry. They're doing it in a whole different way. And I pray for them often. It's a, uh, there's some wonderful things going on in that ministry. But they had to adjust. They had to, they had to turn everything upside down. They had to change the way things looked. They had to change the way they were thinking. They had to change the type of ministry they were. They, they don't have people like you in their church anymore. They don't have people like me in their church. They have people that are different. They could not be in a state of Acadia. They, they could not just sit there and let it happen because it, it, it just slowly meandering worked down to almost nothing. They had to replant, is what they call that in church now. Not a new plant, but a replant. Out with the old, in with the new. Are we irrelevant? Now, I don't mean just us here in church again. You know, I, I think God's, God's working in us. But the church as a whole, churches are dying at such a rate that they're, they're only being replaced by new churches in more relevant uh, situations about one to every two that are dying. About a 50% rate. Thousands and thousands and thousands every year churches and ministries are dying without being replaced. Just in the U.S. People need to hear the gospel. Are we missing out? Are we in Acadia? People need hope. They want answers. And you and I know what the answer is. It's Jesus. It's easy for us. Or it, maybe it seems that way now. But it's not easy for them to hear it, much less understand it. Many, many church, many people in the church, including me, have fought a lot of the changes that this pandemic has brought about. It, you, you know, I, I hope I appear to be uh, that I'm rolling with it all, but inside is not. This is my first time, you know, it's, it's like my if my grandfather was ever, well, if God meant us to fly, he'd have given us wings, you know, <laughs> never get on an airplane. This is kind of my airplane for my generation. It's like, well, God, if God ever meant for us to be on TV, he'd have made us all Jerry Falwell, right? I, I thought that. I honestly never, ever thought that we would be talking to a camera <laughs> in worship. Blows my mind. That it, and it's so, it's, it's so crazy that it makes me want to laugh. Laugh at myself. Because you know what? I would have never done that. 
Those extra 100 people that I was talking about earlier, they would have never, ever heard what we had to say. You and I sitting here in these pews was enough for me. And I, I got to be honest with you. I, 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 you know, when I came to this church, we were taping worship. Do you know that? And, and good old brother Paul, I, I told Gaines when I first got here, I said, Gaines, you, you don't really have to tape those anymore. <laughs> I even put a stop to that. Not that I was defensive about it, but it just didn't seem important to me. And here we are live. On, on Everything has changed. I was forced, or maybe drug, kicking and screaming into this by something so negative as a pandemic. And there's people who are responding to our ministry that we don't even know. Someday I'll have to write you some of the comments that they make. I think you would be very encouraged to hear. Many of the churches are like that. But now, here we are embracing it. You've heard the phrase, change or die. Change or die. Get busy living, get busy dying. We're changing. We're going to get busy living, aren't we? And that's what we're doing. That's why we're here. And I'm pleased with it would take God alone to change my heart. So are we praying for people? Are we praying for people to repent? Here's the next, next point the scripture makes me think of. The intensity of our prayers must match the intensity of the moment. That's a quote from somebody. I couldn't find who, but I will acknowledge that's not an original. <laughs> the intensity of prayer must match the intensity of the moment, I heard someone say once. What is our moment? Well, it, it could be this pandemic, right? So, so what if the moment is actually what happens as a result, uh, spiritually, as a result of the pandemic? Perhaps God has planned all of this together to come to fruition for something such as a revival. Is our intensity of prayer matching the intensity of that moment? Are we praying for people? Are we praying for people to repent? Are we praying that each other will repent? To begin a movement of confession that will lead to revival. Confession. It's a make or break time for the church. Great challenges for the church. Probably the greatest challenge I think that the church has seen since I've been in the church. And I'm hearing the same exact story from other preachers. And, and first it begins in a negative form. Many, many people are staying away from the church. That's what other preachers are telling me. And we see it too, right? And, and, and many are not staying away because of health risk or, or fear or concern for others, which is a viable reason I understand. But they're staying away because this is their excuse. The pandemic is used as an excuse not to attend church. Well, honestly, folks, you can say, big deal. But where is their spirit? That tells us what's going on in their heart. Acadia. Acadia, the idea that we can rest on our spiritual laurels and believe God will be pleased with us, pff, ain't going to happen. God wants us to use this time to be a voice of truth. Last week we talked about being a voice for God, that God would use us to speak into society, to speak into our friends, words of encouragement, but words that would hold up the morality. Can I tell you, can I say what you were telling us at, at Deacon's meeting? Do you mind me? You know, you know, Coach was talking about, and this is just natural with young boys, right? 
he said that the boys on the, on, the, on the football team, he would walk through the locker and one of them used an expletive, okay? And then they go, oh, there's Coach BJ. So they already knew. When you're around Coach BJ, the morality of things have to be thought of a little bit higher. Now, they also have to run laps, I think, don't they, when they get caught like that. BJ's pushing those boys towards something the higher, greater than they're used to. Now, that alone is not going to save their soul, but it's going to give them a hunger to expect more for themselves, to expect more from their country, to expect more from the people around them. And maybe they decide through that, you know, I don't want to have a relationship like everybody talks about on TV. Maybe I want to have a moral relationship. Maybe I don't want to be like everybody acts is normal anymore. Maybe I want to step it up a level. Gee whiz, maybe I want to go to church like my grandma used to do. You just never know we're speaking something like that. Another one of our deacons was, was speaking about somebody that, that had taken some money, and it wasn't a lot, but, the, but they, they pressed them over and over and over in their business. Don't steal from the business. He held them accountable to what they were at, and they were just kids at that time, probably teenagers, okay? What if? When he did that, that those kids thought for the first time in their lives, oh, I'm not supposed to steal. For the first time in their life, perhaps it hit them. I want to have a life that is higher in morality. Folks, we can do that as believers. We can challenge the rest of the United States from right here in Wilson, Arkansas, just to step it up a notch. God wants us to speak out, to challenge one another through love and good deeds. To challenge our families, and then our neighbors, and each other. And challenge them to follow God. To challenge the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if it's not pos po popular. Perhaps this is the time for that. In the shadow of 2020. God is at work, and we are challenged to follow him into the fray of the spiritual battle. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you, are you, are you asleep on the couch spiritually, or are you willing and able and prepared to move forward spiritually? Because God needs you in his army, just like Uncle Sam used to say in World War II. Uncle Sam needed you, and now God needs you. And he needs you on your, in your battle position. Do you know what the battle position is? Well, you knees on the floor, so to speak. I have a hard time getting on my knees anymore, <laughs> literally. God wants us in prayer position. That's where we fight the battle. Not with others, but against the foe, against, against sin. And praying for others to come to know Christ. And praying that God would move in our midst. We start with prayer. No kidding, our warfare takes place just on our knees. Prayer and fasting. The kind of prayer that begins with repentance. We've spoken often about that. You know, folks have been concerned about racism and, and which lives matter and... And uh, the new movement that even kind of came out of the George Floyd situation. And you know what? Out of all that, the very least, the very least that we can do in the church. Now, you, you may do more, but the very least we can do, pray, repent. You, you, you may think, well, I got nothing to repent on. Well, I, I'm telling you, you, you can repent. The obvious, oblivious nature of such a crime. Not a crime of a policeman. I'm not talking about what he literally did, but the crime that perhaps people don't even tend to see. 
the national crime that brings about such an event. Why was a guy like George Floyd, where he was at that time, at that place, for whatever reason? That's a national thing. Why would a policeman either feel he should or feel the need to or end up doing whatever he did and the two collided? That's a national sin. We can repent for that. We can say, God, we want something bigger and better than this. We want to rise above this kind of crud. We don't want to ever have to see that again. We want to save both sides from ever having to deal with that. That, it, that we as a nation are so broken, and there's a systemic disease of crime that is out of hand, and we can blame it on a group of people or a them all day, but they are actually a part of us. I don't mind praying. I don't have to be careful. I need to be prayerful. To give your life for one another, man, that's pretty awesome. Jesus asked us to do that. Lay down your life for another man is an awesome thing to do. I can do that by, I can be praying. I, I have more power simply by praying. We're no longer able to be careful. We cannot sit on the fence. We have got to become active. And I don't mean to, to rally at the courthouse with signs. I'm saying to be prayerful. Our activity is to pray. Sitting on the sidelines for a true believer is no longer an option. We must be prayerful. We pray that all lives do matter, every one of them. Lord, when, 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 when is our altar going to be full with people who repent? When will we have a confessing people? I'm not, I'm not, when I saw, talk about confessing, you know, there, there are churches that, that people come up and they, they out loud, they say what they've done. And I'm not necessarily asking you to do that. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about confessing you to the Lord, confessing, telling God what is on your heart, what, what you need to do, a humble state between you and God. Lord, when will we, your church, be more concerned about the sin in our life and in our wor church, in our world, heart-wrenching needs right here among us. When will broken families be restored? And whatever it looks like, Lord, we'll, ac we'll accept your way. When will the racist stuff die down? When will we learn our lesson? Is it when somebody gets their way or their person gets elected? Is it, is it going to stop then? No. Are we a, such a selfish nation, so spoiled that we can't deal with a president we didn't vote for? I'm talking to myself more than I'm talking to anybody. I got, you got to know. We trust in you, God. We trust in whomever. We believe that you design whatever happens. You are ultimately placing whomever in whatever position. Man, I'm going to pray for these people. Are you? I, 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 I'm going to pray for them. I pray for their success. I believe if they are ultimately successful in what they do, that it'll be better for me. But I believe their success will come from God. God can work through anything, anybody. We've been, in Sunday school, we've been reading about Nebuchadnezzar. My goodness, what a godless man. And until Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got into the fiery furnace, 
Boy, he became a believer real quick, didn't he? When he saw that miracle, didn't last long. Before you know it, this morning we read, he was up on the wall talking about how great a, a, a world he had built. And boy, God humbled him. I mean, how humble could you be to be placed on your hands and knees eating grass? Are we in the same position? I saw somebody's meme that says, if we end up with a Nebuchadnezzar, I want to be Daniel. How about you? When I look at those scriptures and I see, you know, Daniel spoke the truth. He spoke straight to the king, the truth of God. But you know what? He was still a buddy with the king. Somehow he got along with the king. Isn't that amazing? The king tried to kill him. And he still got, away, he still got along with the king. I want to be that kind of guy. Lord, when? When is your will going to be done here? We trust in you, God, to choose our government. Lord, when? Will we, your church, get on our knees? When, Lord? Uh, Lord, and, then, and Lord, let it begin with me. I, I'm willing. I'm available, God. I, I, I'm not too proud. When will our hearts be broken over lostness, people who don't know him? When will we weep a tear for our neighbor? Not because of their sin, but because they are lost without Jesus Christ. And we've got to confess to you, God, that our hearts are not soft to the lost souls of, the, of this whole generation. We are not. Our hearts are hard. We are unwilling and unable to change our ways for the sake of lost people. Folks, you know what? Lost people just act like lost people, don't they? The world doesn't walk through the door of most churches anymore just because they're out of habit. Like I was talking about in Pine Bluff where people just got up, got their kids dressed, put on their coat and tie and took off to church. Rare, rare exceptions anymore. It's sad. But without watering down our message, without changing what God's word says, what can we do to accept lost people? Are we willing to do it? Little things, little things. Think about it. And I'm not saying these are our, my suggestions today. These are, these, are, these are just ideas. What if we got rid of all of our ties, coat and ties, and ladies quit wearing hats? Oh, wait a minute. That's already happened. <laughs> What if we allowed women to wear slacks in church? Well, I didn't check. Sorry, sorry ladies, I'm not, I'm not going to check, but I, I think that's happened, right? We've come a long way, haven't we? Do you know why we're doing that? It's not just to be comfortable. There's a specific reason why churches are doing that. It's so the people on the outside, when they come in, are going to feel more comfortable. I don't want to have to tell some guy, well, you know, you got a Budweiser t-shirt is all you got to your name. You can't come to my church. Because y'all remember when that happened? Not so many years ago. I had, I had a guy that never came back to church because he came in here and he had that shirt on. And at some point, it, I don't think anybody said anything to him. I think he just looked down and realized what, what had happened. He walked in with a Budweiser t-shirt on in the church. Poor fella. And I, I think he was too embarrassed to come by. Are we, are we people who can look beyond the Budweiser t-shirt? What if somebody comes in here without their shoes on? That happens a lot. That sounds kind of radical, doesn't it? Folks, I, 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 the kids do it all the time, right? <laughs> you know, it may not be for me. How about you? 
Is that too crazy just to be okay with where lost people are at? Because they're not going to look like you and I. It's so outsiders will start coming in. We've got to be revising the church constantly so that the church doesn't become irrelevant because we're not the gospel. The gospel's not going to change. It's we who have to be changing. Do you know why we sing new songs? It's not just to try to stay popular. I think, I think there are churches to, that do that just to stay popular. We, we are perfectly comfortable, I am, with singing just old traditional hymns, established stuff that makes me just kind of feel good just by hearing them again. It just takes me back. Well, for many reasons there are that we sing newer songs as well. We mix them together. But one thing is that non-church people are not comfortable with our traditions. They're not part of that. They feel like it's a us versus them. We want them to feel like one of us. We don't build walls between us and them. We try to tear them down. Some of these songs feel a little bit more like they grew up with. Do you remember two centuries ago, there was a group of fellas that decided they were going to redo all the hymns. And so they went to the bars. They went to the bars. Before your great-great-great-grandmother was in church, they went to the bars and learned all the drinking songs. And then they put Christian words to the drinking songs. And so the next time old so-and-so showed up, great, great, our great-great-great-great-grandfather showed up in church, he said, well, I know that song. His wife probably had to put his hand down. Don't, don't do that. He's so used to having his beer in his hand. Put your hand down. <laughs> they engaged those people for a lost generation. Do you know... That's where oh, For a Thousand Tongues to Sing came from. That's where some of these hymns came from. It was from the bars. There's nothing wrong with it. God redeemed those songs for his glory. For lost people, for younger people. Yes, mature spiritual people often at any age will sing just about anything that comes to their worship. And that's great. But it's the seekers those people who we want to capture to hear the gospel. Are we willing to go through a few discomforts? There will be a time in which somebody, it may not be this preacher, by the way, somebody is going to ask us to get rid of these pews. I mean, churches all over the place are doing it. It's not on my list, okay? So don't worry. But it, is that going to blow our fuse? Because is there something about those pews that, that just look a little bit too traditional, a little bit that, that makes a person that's not from the church background uncomfortable? Are we willing to give up a pew for a soul? Are you ready for seekers to come in? Are you ready to give up the discomforts? The comforts of tradition, are you willing to give them up? So they'll feel more a part of us, so they will walk into the door, so they will hear the gospel. We can't be careful about it anymore. We can be prayerful. This pandemic shutdown has been in this whole world, shutting down, the only God is powerful enough to do that. And I believe it could be a prelude to worldwide revival. And I'm prepared to get prepared. <laughs> I'm prepared for a few discomforts. I'm prepared to learn. I'm prepared to rend heaven and earth for the sake of the gospel that others will hear. Let's close again with the same scripture that we spoke about earlier. 2 Chronicles 7.14 And it asks us, look, before we, we hear, it's a conditional response God's telling us. 
Not unconditional, it's conditional. If you meet this criteria, if you meet these conditions, God says, I will match it with my demands. Listen, he says, if we humble ourselves, get in a correct posture, if we pray and we fast, if we seek God's face, if we confess and we turn from our wicked ways, as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a town, as a nation, then God's going to hear and he's going to forgive and he's going to heal. Here's Second Chronicles 7.14. Would you stand with me? We're going to use this as our closing theme. God's word says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's pray together. God, this is our prayer. Lord, that we will be able to be humble. Each one of us individually and as a church. And Lord, that we will pray and we will sacrifice part of ourselves as fasting in order to Seek your face. We want your way, not our way, Lord. And God, we are, are, are bent towards turning away from wickedness. And we ask for your help and your guidance and your power by the Holy Spirit to do that. Because, Lord, you say that you will hear from heaven. And, Lord, we want you to hear us, to bless us. We want your kingdom come, and we want your forgiveness, and God, we want our land to be healed, and we will trust you in that. Lord, we don't have a timetable. We don't have you in a box. We just simply ask, Lord, will you do this in us, and let it begin with me. We all would say, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, my friends.